Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us uh, on this really important day for our work around higher education. Um, it's great to see so many colleagues here. Uh, for those of you who are new to our work at the EDGE Foundation, uh, I'm Ollie Newton, I'm the Executive Director here, and uh, our work is all around trying to make education more relevant from primary school all the way through to higher education and beyond. Uh, and that's really the core of what we're talking about today, trying to bring the, the world of education to, to life with examples from the real world, with connections to the world of work, with preparations for great careers and great lives after study. Um, just a few Zoom niceties before we start off. Um, so uh, you'll see at the bottom of your screens, you'll have a, a button for Q&A. We'd love to hear questions from you. Uh, we've got the presentations uh, from the researchers, and then we've got a great panel coming up of uh, students and employers who are involved in the models. So do uh, add some Q&A as we go along. Uh, you've also got the chat function as well. So feel free to use that to uh, talk to each other, reflect, uh, connect during this presentation as well. Uh, we're, we're really keen to make this uh, part of the growing edge community as well. Um, just to let you know as well, we'll be recording the session um, so that others can enjoy this afterwards who might not have been able to make it. So without further ado, I'm really delighted to welcome uh, Colin Reardon, who is the Vice Chancellor of Cardiff University, but also one of our brilliant trustees here at the Edge Foundation. And Colin is going to be chairing today. Colin, welcome. Thank you very much, Holly, and uh, my welcome to you, uh, all our participants today. Thank you very much for coming. So just some uh, sense of what we're aiming to do today. It's to share some uh, new insights and reflections on graduate employability and how important it is really for or the role, uh, the important role of universities in helping our students to be sure uh, that they're ready for their future in a very um, uncertain labour market over the next um, few years, particularly, of course, in the situation we find ourselves in the moment, but also um, more broadly than that. Uh, I mean, just, just apart from COVID, there have been big changes in, certainly since I was a student, and, and much more recently than that, in terms of people embarking on uh, portfolio careers rather than spending a long time in a particular line. Uh, the advent of the digital economy, um, one of those things that has been, like so many things, changes accelerated by uh, the coronavirus experience, and I'm sure there'll be more of that to come. Uh, and of course, pressing issues which hugely influence the future, such as climate change, um, and in our kind of corner of the world, uh, Brexit having an effect on things too, I'm sure. So what we're having today is, first of all, um, three presentations on the EDGE Foundation's latest research. Um, and the, the research was looking, in, in different di looking at different dimensions of uh, graduate employability. So the factors contributing to graduate career satisfaction, uh, for example, where the strongest relationship was found between support for the development of transferable skills during the student's degree and their subsequent career satisfaction. It's something we've always sort of suspected, um, and it's very helpful to have that kind of um, uh, direct research and results that will help inform our practice. And the research also identified a positive link between career satisfaction and how proactive universities are in supporting their career planning. So uh, graduates who said they found the job through their university via the career service or the course, um, were, that is compared to finding the job via some other means, such as a recruitment agency or website. Uh, those ones who were supported and through the university were earning slightly more on average of 1.2, well, £1,200 a year was probably more than slightly more, £1,200 a year more on average, but only 8% of graduates found their jobs through that route. So that is a real pointer to universities that um, we may be able to uh, and should be thinking of providing more support, uh, considering that um, such a small proportion went through that uh, route, because that way we can help our graduates do better in the workplace. And I mentioned um, COVID earlier on that I, I do feel very, I do feel very much for this, for the generation of, let's call them um, sort of 18 to early 20s, or perhaps even a bit younger to early 20s, those uh, people have been badly hit both in terms of their education you know there's real uncertainty over their careers prospects job vacancies have 
fallen by 65% compared to the same period last year. Now, we all will hope, of course, that there'll be a V-shaped recovery and a bounce back, but there is huge uncertainty there, and there will be a very changed world and a different type of job market, and we want to be able to support our students to prepare them as best we can to face those um, uncertainties. So, uh, first of all, we're going to hear about the uh, three pieces of research that, that show um, new approaches, uh, forward-thinking approaches, even by universities that have successfully prepared their students to be highly employable and career-ready um, upon graduation. Uh, now, full disclosure, um, one of those examples is from Cardiff University, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of Cardiff University. Uh, another of them is from the University of Essex, and before I was uh, Vice Chancellor here, I was vice chancellor there, and in fact, was part of the um, uh, really took part in the launch of the Edge Hotel School there that you'll be hearing about, and of course, did the same with the National Software Academy that you'll be hearing about too. Now, after the research presentations, if you do want to ask questions of our um, researchers who, who are presenting the results, I'd be grateful if you could put those into the QA and, and they will be answered through the chat. Um, we will have uh, then three presentations from our panelists and these are actually the people who are actually involved with all this the students themselves um, some of who, who are now actually working but have been through the uh, process uh, and uh, and a representative of employers who've been involved in all this as well and those will be there again if you could put questions in the q a and i will pose them then live to the panelists who will be discussing all of this so We'll start now with the research presentations. I'll just uh, explain who's going to present and they will in turn uh, introduce um, uh, themselves a little bit when, when, they, when they do their presentations. But we'll hear first of all um, from Kat Ems, who's, the who's an education and policy researcher at the EDGE Foundation. And Kat is gonna be talking about Cardiff University's National Software Academy, which is actually based in Newport. Um, we will then hear from uh, Daryl Bravenbohr, who's the Director of Apprenticeships and Professor of Higher Education and Skills uh, at the Centre for Apprenticeship and Skills at Middlesex University. And Daryl's going to be talking about Middlesex University's sustainable degree apprenticeships. Um, and then we will uh, hear from Andrea Lutzik, who's the Head of Research at the EDGE Foundation. And Andrea is going to be uh, talking about the Edge Hotel School and the experience uh, with that. And uh, so Andrea's uh, done some uh, very valuable research on the, uh, the, the way in which that has, has, has developed. So I, I, I will let each of the, I'll ask each of the uh, presenters to introduce the next one. So I, I'll pop up once we've had these three presentations and I'll hand over now, please, to uh, Kat for the first presentation. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Colin. Um, and I promise Colin didn't pay me to do this presentation. Um, this is all off our own backs at Edgebrook Foundation. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Really pleased to see many of you here. I'm going to be talking to you today about a piece of research that I did with uh, my colleague, Andrea Latzik, on the National Software Academy, which is part of Cardiff University. Um, and can we just move on to the next slide, Ali? Thanks. Um, NSA is actually part of Cardiff University and was established in 2015, offering um, a BSc in Applied Software Engineering. They also offer master's course as well, but um, this piece of research actually focuses on the BSc. And we chose to do this piece of research as they were delivering um, an undergraduate course that appeared to be quite an alternative way to traditional higher education. So using things like project-based learning, lots of hands-on experience throughout the course, um, encouraging uh, students to take part in paid work placements that were relevant to the course itself. And we're really establishing really close partnerships with industry as well. Um, and so from even the early days, we were hearing that the students that were working with employers were um, having really positive experiences in the workplace and were hitting the ground running and were highly employable as well. So we wanted to investigate this model um, a bit more. Um, just to give you a bit of context um, to the National Software Academy. So as I said, it's part of Cardiff University, but it's actually based in Newport, which is 
10 to 15 miles down the road. And that area itself um, has quite a skills gap, particularly um, in software engineers, as is the case nationally as well. Um, there's a high proportion of low qualified adults um, trained in software engineering. And um, previous to the National Software Academy being set up, um, graduates that were going into the workplace, uh, businesses were feeding back that they were taking about 12 to 18 months actually to be fully productive um, within the business. And businesses really wanted graduates that were ready to be productive and um, contribute to the business as soon as they get into the workplace. Um, also as well, it's an area of quite high deprivation and the government really wanted to try and stimulate the economy, uh, make it an attractive place for businesses and startups to join. So in 2013, the Welsh government, they set up a task force uh, to try and improve the economy of Newport. And one of the recommendations from that was the establishment of the NSA, which was um, a partnership between uh, Cardiff University, between the Welsh Government and also employers as well. So yeah, the aims of our research uh, was we really wanted to understand um, if this new model of undergraduate delivery was successful and what particularly made it successful. So we really wanted to get down into the, the course design, the delivery, um, and how it was developed to try and understand this. As, like I said before, feedback for employers were that um, graduates were business ready um, and they were hitting the ground running. Um, and so we wanted to understand uh, what parts, factors in the NSA were really um, contributing to this work readiness. So next slide, please, to do this. Um, we took a qualitative approach and we did quite a number of semi-structured interviews with um, teaching staff in the NSA, senior leadership um, and government representatives. And particularly those two were involved in the initial setup and design of the NSA as well. So that gave us some really valuable insight. And then we spoke to several employers as well who were um, involved in different capacities with the NSA. Um, some had taken on graduates or had hosted student placements as well. We also did eight focus groups with students, so from levels one to three. Um, and on top of these interviews and focus groups, we also um, attended the NSA on a couple of occasions to observe project showcase events. So these were at the end of the semester, students were there to present their work to employers and to their teachers and this really showed evidence of the skills development and the student employer interactions so they were really valuable to see. So there were five key areas that uh, we thought were particularly significant that I'd like to talk to you about today um, and these were really valuable in um, developing employable graduates so Hopefully, have time to talk about each one of these in turn. If we could just go on to the next one, please. Um, so the first one was the wide-ranging employer engagement that we saw, and this was um, sustained and meaningful throughout the course. Um, it's really um, significant the different number of ways that employers would engage with the NSA, and uh, the breadth and depth of these as well. So as well as these ad hoc um, inputs that I mentioned here, the, the guest lectures, the lunch and learn. So perhaps an employer would come in and do a, a talk for students, which you often see in other places as well. There was a lot of ongoing uh, employee engagement. And this um, was from the initial course design. So from the very initiation of the NSA, um, employers were sat around a table, different voices, you know, large organizations, small um, software engineering firms, really uh, inputting into the, what the course should look like. And then importantly, this is an ongoing development as well. So um, from early on till up till the present day, um, we ensure that it's relevant and up to date as well. Um, 
And then also students take part in client facing projects. So if we can just flip onto the next slide quickly. Um, this explains it a bit more. It's really taking kind of a project based learning approach. So um, different clients set a, uh, a project for teams and students work on a, a different client facing project every semester. So the second half of every semester throughout three years, students are involved in these kind of authentic um, projects. So they've had various um, um, employers that the students spoke about working with, for example, Transport for Wales, or the Students' Union, a local bar, so all sorts of um, organisations, some large software engineering firms, but some that are not um, software engineering specialists at all. And then the end product would be um, the students um, feeding back to the employers what their design, their product is. And then throughout this process, the, the students are working in small teams and they're having ongoing communications with the employer as well, gathering um, information from them, feeding back. So this is really developing their employee, um, their communication skills. Um, can we just go back one, please? Back one slide, one more, thank you. Um, yeah, another significant um, input from the employers were the industry tutors as well. Um, this is quite a, quite a unique um, aspect, we thought. So, for example, an employee from a local firm would come in perhaps for a few hours every week and take part in the classroom sessions to support the students, um, answering questions, perhaps. Um, helping them, those that are struggling, struggling a little bit with um, the work. And this was also really good professional development from the employer's side as well. Perhaps they were new graduates and they were having this opportunity to support students in this way. Um, can we just go on to, yeah, that's brilliant. The next uh, finding was about um, the explicit teaching of employability skills. So um, there was a clear framework established for the teaching of these. So they were referenced in particular modules, which ones were gonna be taught and assessed. Um, and then this is really significant in the fact that students were very self-aware and reflective on which skills they were developing and at what point. So in the focus groups, they were able to give clear examples of, um, for example, where they've learned to be independent. So that's a really useful skill for when they're, for example, in a um, job interview. And then on top of these, these employees, employability skills were taught explicitly as well to the students. So for example, they might have an external expert come in to deliver a day's workshop on how to work as a team. And they'd outline the different roles and responsibilities of team members, how you might deal with conflict, um, and this really prepared students for then the practical elements of working in a team. Um, next slide, please. Can we go to the next? Oh, yeah. Um, so as students progressed, like I said, this um, theory of the employability skills was put into practice in more meaningful environments. So for example, um, in the client facing projects or on a large scale in terms of the placements as well. Um, next slide, please. Okay, the next um, finding was about the linking of the theory and practice. Um, so in some ways, this also relates to the employability skills that took a similar cycle. So the theory, the skills was introduced and then they'd be given practical um, situations in which to practice these, but also, um, in terms of the software engineering theory as well. So on a daily basis, um, student, uh, teachers and students were quite uh, clear that there were no lectures at the National Software Academy. Um, instead, classroom sessions were about two and a half hours long and they'd cycle between this 20 minutes of introducing a theory and then practical tasks, whether that's individual tasks or working as a team on a particular area. 
And as this quote at the bottom says, if you're talking for more than 20 minutes and you've got it wrong, they were strongly encouraged not to do that um, from a teaching point of view. And then on a large scale, this was also seen at the program level. So at a macro level, um, there was this introduction of theory. Um, and then as the semester progressed, more opportunities to apply the knowledge um, and apply it and practice it in more realistic settings. So the client facing projects again, or the placements with employers as well. Okay, next slide. Um, the workspaces um, were particularly significant in the fact that they were more like an office or work-like environment. As you can see from this picture at the bottom, it resembles more of an office uh, in the same way that there are no lectures, there are no lecture theatres as well at the NSA. Um, they, they were more kind of open collaborative spaces, they had the the wall surfaces that they could brainstorm and plan ideas on. And likewise, the, the operations of the business as well were kind of taken into account and uh, used at the NSA. So some modules might have a, a five minute daily stand up at the beginning that some software engineering firms might use a similar technique um, and using the same technology that they'd find in the firm. Um, yeah, and just to say in the workspaces as well, those kind of the communal areas, the kitchen areas that were very, um, very much shared and open, kind of like a professional environment. And then the final finding is the, the strong relationships, which as this diagram shows, kind of between the three key stakeholders were very significant and very strong. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of examples if we go into the next slide. So between the staff, the NSA staff and employers. Um, this was particularly strong. There was a lot of um, different employers that the, the staff worked with. And the staff actually, a lot of them came from industrial backgrounds. So they could build on their previous exp experience and networks, but also the senior leadership team were very encouraging that um, NSA staff um, went to networking events, um, dropped in on employers and made sure that their, um, their knowledge were kept up to date and relevant in terms of industry standards. Um, so for, for example, as well, the staff might drop in on a student placement as well to try and um, nurture that relationship even more. And this really benefited the students because they'd be taking their knowledge back to the classroom and perhaps changing module content based on what they'd learned from um, their industry knowledge as well. Um, I just talk about the staff student relationships as well on the next slide. Um, I think this is really helpful because also of the work like environment, it was a much lesser hierarchical relationship between the students and the teachers. So compared to perhaps um, traditional higher education environment, I think the relationship was a lot more equal and the students were seen as professionals themselves. So students were even encouraged to bring their expertise back to the NSA following their industrial placement and um, lecturers considered their knowledge valuable, might even in turn change some of the content um, based on that. Um, and yeah, like I say, the, the kind of workspace and the shared open environment really helped um, nurture that. And then also in terms of the peer relationship as well, this was very strong. Um, the, the project work that the students took part in, if we just go back one slide, thank you. Um, they, they would mention that they were a lot more sociable and they were able to uh, understand their peers' strengths and weaknesses and help them with their, their work or their project a lot more because of the, all the elements of teamwork that took place at the NSA as well. Um, so yeah, if we just flick onto the next slide, there's a few quotes there that I'll let you 
read through yourself. But in summary, we really thought that these elements of the NSA delivery uh, were purposely built around um, student employability, which made them work so well. Um, each of the elements had a connection to employment or employers in the workplace. And so they're not all necessarily unique to the NSA. However, their combination and the intensity in the, uh, of each of the elements were what really contributed to the outcomes and the successful uh, graduates and students in the workplace. Thank you. And then, um, yeah, thank you. Any uh, questions, I'm happy to answer them in the Q&A and also uh, I can share the report as well in the chat function. So thank you. And I'll hand over to Terrell now. Daryl, are you able to share your video and mic? Great. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Yes. So I'm Daryl Bravenbaugh. I'm Director of Apprenticeships at uh, Middlesex University. Um, so I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about a EDGE Foundation funded research project that we um, undertook um, recently. And it's, as you can see on the screen, it's to do with uh, sustainable degree apprenticeships. Okay. So, um, as you can see by the, uh, the, the badges on, on the bottom of the, the slide there, uh, this was a collaborative project uh, led by Middlesex, but working with a number of different uh, two universities and also the University Vocational Awards Council as, as partners in the project. Now that's important um, from a number of reasons. One is that uh, all of those organizations have a track record in delivering and developing work-based and work-integrated learning, even in advance of the whole kind of apprenticeship initiative. So um, there's some uh, really good and well-established practice that all three of the project partners have been, uh, can, have been able to draw on. Um, the, there's also a kind of common um, uh, belief, I suppose, that um, you know, there is value in uh, recognizing that the workplace uh, can be a primary source of learning. So if you imagine, I mean, there are, there's, there's stuff in the, uh, in the report that you can see on the screen about this, but if you imagine you know, what one of the things that apprentices might do is enable people to get through to a professional career at the end of it, then there are, there are different traditional models in which uh, people might do that. So there are sequential models whereby they do some kind of qualification first and then do some practice and then become professionally competent after that. And then there are parallel models whereby they're in a job and they're doing some kind of a day release course, night school, whatever it is in parallel with it, which may or may not be directly aligned and integrated with what they're doing on a day to day basis. And then there's a kind of integrated model, which is actually, you know, relating uh, both um, the learning that's occurring in any context, whether it's in, you know, in a provider or university context, uh, or learning that's taking place uh, through work, and trying to maximise and integrate that learning so that it enables people to develop uh, into and, and meet the kind of professional requirements that they, that they need to demonstrate and become competent. So all of the partners involved had that kind of track record and mindset of uh, that there was value in that kind of thing. And the, the apprenticeship agenda and the, particularly the degree apprenticeship agenda has provided opportunities to really kind of mainstream that kind of longstanding um, tradition and, and, and range of expertise that the partners have brought to bear. Okay. Ah, 
Ah, there we go. Um, so, yeah, what was what was the project all about? So, um, as um, people may know, so apprenticeships are jobs that have um, as a requirement uh, training in them to, you know, approved uh, standards. In this case, national standards. And we're talking about apprenticeships from an English point of view here, because there are different um, rules and regulations in different devolved nations. So this project was was looking at the provision of degree apprenticeships and trying to, uh, as it says here, in, investigate what kind of practice and structures might we put in place or, or, or indeed are in place that are likely to um, enable providers of degree apprenticeships to do that on a sustainable basis. Are there certain systemic or organisational barriers that are impeding the sustainability of that provision and that might there be any potential solutions that uh, could be found. So that's one kind of thing. So it's kind of look, look at existing practices, look at uh, what people have said about those existing practices and see whether there are some sort of common patterns that we might identify and be able to draw on to you know, advise uh, the sector about what things might be most successful to sustain the provision of degree apprenticeships. Secondly, we, you know, there, there are and there have been and then there will, you know, probably continue to be some myths and, con and misconceptions about the relationship between universities and apprenticeships and, and, and indeed degree apprenticeships. And that's not just, you know, from within the, the university, se university sector. It's not just, you know, outside of universities, but it's also in other parts of the education sector and so forth. So, um, you know, in some of the you know, FE sector and in the FE press, there's been a positioning of universities as not really knowing much about understanding professional competence and, 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 and that kind of skills training. Whereas of course, you know, in universities, for example, if you take nursing, you know, have been actually developing professional competence uh, for a long, long time. So, so we, the part of it was to kind of explore some of those mis misconceptions from all sides and to try and weigh them against each other and to try and, um, you know, find a way through those things to, to establish a kind of um, a, a conception of degree apprenticeships that, uh, you know, was clearer for all the parties, all the stakeholders involved. And lastly, you know, this, this wasn't this, we, we, we started off thinking that degree apprenticeships are a good idea. So we, you know, we were wanting to promote and support the development of a sustainable system for uh, the provision of degree apprenticeships. We weren't agnostic about that. We weren't thinking, oh, maybe they're not a good idea. So, you know, we came into it with a point of view thinking these things are a good idea, but there might be ways in which we can do them more effectively to make it more sustainable. And most importantly, might there be ways in which we can make clearer and establish better evidence of how they're contributing to productivity? And by productivity, we included in that kind of definition, kind of um, service quality enhancement, for example, in the public sector. It's not just about making more widgets or whatever. It's about doing things better. And also um, social mobility. So the extent to which apprenticeships and degree apprenticeships are enabling people from under underrepresented groups and also potentially disadvantaged groups access professional careers through degree apprenticeships because I mean, there's been you know various reports that have come out about that and about how the, you know in some cases the um uh, the achievements so far have not met that, that you know not been as socially uh, mobile as, as as perhaps had been hoped i mean it's quite early and a lot of the public sector data in terms of the larger numbers hadn't kicked in when some of those reports have been published but nonetheless the, we're thinking about how can that be positioned in such a way, such a way as to make it again clearer uh, to be able to demonstrate that that's that's being achieved across the sector okay so um what what we did in the project um we 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 agreed to um produce three things really one was a report one was something called the uh, center for degree apprenticeships and we also agreed to have various kind of dissemination events so in in producing the report obviously you know what underpinned that was the the research that was undertaken so for that research, we conducted a, um, a, a literature review and, and 
the two of us that actually pulled the report together, Stan Lester, a colleague of mine and myself, we'd also worked on a literature review for the QAA looking at work integrated degrees. And so there'd been some, some um, previous literature review work that fed into this. But we broadened uh, the field of, uh, of literature for this because since that 2016 review, there'd been you know, further work in the area of higher degree apprenticeships that wasn't the case even, even, even just four years ago. So we broadened the work, but also included kind of official reports uh, and um, publications and so forth, as well as traditional kind of uh, academic literature. Um, we then we conducted semi-structured interviews and, and in all cases we're looking for the views of employers, for providers, uh, and by providers I mean you know universities or other higher education providers for degree apprenticeships and also crucially um, apprentices of course. And we had a particular focus, each of the university partners had sort of expertise in, in delivering lots of apprenticeships but we focused on three key sectors and uh, digital engineering and nursing were the three uh, sectors that uh, were chosen. So Middlesex focused on nursing and, and Sheffield Hallam focused on engineering and uh, Staffordshire focused on the digital sector. Um, and we, we did that so that we could have some kind of focus to it to try and get some kind of in-depth views from employers, providers and apprentices in relation to those key sectors. We, we've explained in the report how we kind of selected those sectors because, um, you know, we've got a large public sector, one we've got uh, that has a significant impact, we've got engineering which has a long tradition of offering apprenticeships, and we've got digital which is fairly cross-cutting across sectors. So we thought that by having those kind of different uh, kinds of sectors involved, we you know get a kind of a richer mix, mix of, uh, of information from our, um, from our research. And then we also conducted a survey with employers and providers and apprentices and this for this we kind of broadened the field a little bit so they weren't only employers and providers and apprentices in the digital engineering or nursing, nursing sectors, it was uh, more broadly than that and we, and we finished off with findings and so forth. So um, a little bit on the Centre for Degree Apprenticeships, um, this um, has uh, been established now, it's, it's live, there, there's the link for it. It's for um, UVAC uh, members to, to access, of which there are kind of 90 odd uh, universities um, and HE providers across the country. And it's a really a kind of um, a, a think tank. It's a method of sharing best practice in, in relation to the delivery of uh, and development of, of degree apprenticeships. So for example, you'll see in the dissemination events as a CDA knowledge net, network, network event. So there've been um, two of those that are focused particularly on the police constable degree apprenticeship, for example, that have had different providers of, of that apprenticeship have come together, together to share their experiences and experts so there's a kind of an ongoing kind of um, research, and, research and development of best practice in, in those particular apprenticeship areas and that's one of the outcomes from, from this particular project. There's another knowledge network event coming up for the academic professional apprenticeship in January for example. So that's an ongoing sustainable outcome from, from the project and as I mentioned there were a number of dissemination events to kind of share uh, you know, the, um, the outcomes from the project that are, that are listed there. Okay, so um, some of the key things that, were, that came about from the, uh, from the literature review. Uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, the literature was telling us that the, although there's potential to improve social mobility that lots of people are talking about, there's actually, you know, that that's not being realised um, as much as it could be, um, partly because you know that there was kind of confused messages about degree apprenticeships. It was positioned as an alternative to going to university. Well, it's not an alternative. It's a different way of achieving the same aim. So some of those messages were, were and you know, there's the uh, not going to uni kind of you know uh, website, which again positions it as something different. Uh, rather than a different kind of uh, approach to it. And I think some of those, that, some of that messaging, I don't think has helped to get a, a, a consistent message out to people who might benefit from um, undertaking a degree apprenticeship. And some of those people might be 
you know, um, people from who were undertaking lower level apprenticeships who hadn't realised that there might be progression opportunities from either further education or lower level apprenticeships through to degree apprenticeships. I mean, for example, you know, um, the level five um, nursing associate apprenticeship, you know, is, is, very, uh, is very rich and diverse in terms of the uh, range of people who undertake that. And it means that more people from a, a wider uh, range of backgrounds are going to access professional status as a registered nurse because uh, nursing associate is a, is a fantastic stepping stone to become a registered nurse and, and you can do that progressing through an apprenticeship route. So and, and not, you know, those kind of things aren't in place in every single sector and also people aren't aware of those routes some, in some places where they are available. Um, yes, there's been it's you know there's been um, some issues in terms of the Institute for Apprenticeships approach to the mandatory qualification rule, which determines whether or not you can have a qualification mandated within an apprenticeship uh, in England. And there's been some resistance, and there's there's a real growth in degree apprenticeships from 2015 when they first started, but it's really completely plateaued and has, and has started to drop off and that's because really it's become much harder for you know for trailblazer groups even though they want it to, to have a degree in an apprenticeship to get one approved now that i'll come on to later but that that is significantly changing by the way but that has had an effect in terms of the range of degree apprenticeship standards that are available there are lots of them but there, there would have been a lot more had, had that policy not been implemented in that way uh, again, you know, there have been issues with, um, you know, getting standards approved and, you know, there's, there's a recognised, you know, need for greater expertise of, of higher education and, and indeed professional standards when uh, um, degree apprenticeships are being developed. Uh, when it first, when the initiative first started, you know, the, the guidance would be don't elect providers of apprenticeships in the room, only the employers can be in the room. Now the guidance is very different that for a degree apprenticeship, you kind of have to work with a number of universities in the development. And that's absolutely right. You know, the, the appropriate range of expertise, still employer led, but the appropriate range of expertise in the room to drive the development is, is important. Uh, yeah, so this this one, the quality assurance, you know, the overlaps, is it, you know, is it Ofsted, is it, is it OFS and QAA and so forth? Who's got, uh, you know, um, quality assurance responsibilities for endpoint assessment? There are been various consultations and there's been some confusion around that, that, you know, haven't always helped in terms of clarity. And I'll come on to that with the recommendations a bit later. Um, similarly, there's, there's kind of a lot of contention about what apprentice, apprenticeships for. You know, classically, are they, for example, as we as we would contend, you know, um, a vehicle for enhancing productivity and also providing opportunities for social mobility? Uh, or are they to try and fix the problem with um, people who haven't done very well at school? And that is a very different, you know, purpose. So, you know, the degree apprenticeships were launched and positioned, you know, in terms of enhancing productivity for sure. And social mobility, you know, followed very closely on, on, on the heels in terms of a policy uh, objective. But latterly, a lot of the discussions in the press, for example, and a lot of stuff picked up in this review have been about uh, other people who think they should be prioritising lower level apprenticeships and younger people who haven't done so well at school, for example. So at policy level, that confusion can be a bit of a barrier. Okay, so just just briefly on, on, on these. So just to let you, so I mentioned earlier that um, you know we conducted interviews um, and that they were intended to provide an kind of in-depth qualitative um, um, information and data uh, regarding the perceptions of apprentices, employers, and providers. Uh, you can see here kind of the, the range the range of them. They were um, um, focused on those three sectors: digital nursing and engineering, and of course. The, 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 there are more people who, from uh, providers, staff, and I guess primarily because we're looking at sustainable models for the provision of, of, um, of degree apprenticeships. So provider staff are particularly relevant, but also informed by the views of employers and apprentices. Uh, a survey. Uh, so um, 
uh, yeah, 165 responses uh, all, all together. So, some, some employers are also providers. Um, but again, um, including those three key sectors, but a wider range of, uh, of responses as well. Um, both both the, um, the interviews and the survey uh, looked specifically at perceptions surrounding social mobility and, and productivity. Because, you know, it, it, we took it that these are the two main priorities for uh, degree apprenticeships because that's that's how they were that's how they were positioned. So we're looking to see how that played out in terms of the perceptions of employers, apprentices, and, and providers. Okay, so um, moving on then. So based upon the literature review, the responses um, from the interviews, and also the rep responses from the surveys. Obviously, we've you know weighed and analysed those, and the detail can be found in the report. But they resulted in a number and range of, of recommendations, and some of these recommendations um, are feeding in to policy level changes now. Um, so there are developments in relation to degree apprenticeships that are taking place um, as we speak that have been to some extent um, influenced by some of the recommendations that have been made here. So um, promotion and outreach, so if, you, if you're going to have uh, degree apprenticeships um, promoted, don't promote it as an alternative to higher education because it isn't. Promote its distinct characteristics, yes, but as a high quality brand in and of itself, uh, as part of, if you like, a, a, fam a family of roots and ways in which you can, you know, people can engage with higher education and, and achieve you know, professional status. Um, so, yeah, so the, the, the dynamics in terms of where we should, should we be focus focusing the use of the apprenticeship levy, for example, for example. So, you know, the, the government's had an industrial strategy. It's identified key sectors that need to be enhanced to, you know, promote and improve productivity, leadership and management, digital, you know, for example. And that should, if there was coherence here, be steering choices in terms of where you prioritise uh, the, use, the use of levy. Um, see, seems self-evident, but it's not necessarily been played out uh, in practice. Um, yeah, so the, the idea that degree apprenticeships are, you know, an absolutely excellent route to, through to professional status for underrepresented groups, it has not been kind of um, highlighted consistently as, as, as a message. And also for, not least for, you know, underrepresented groups such as the existing workforce and indeed lower level apprentices. So those progression routes from lower level apprenticeships through to um, degree apprenticeships have not always been very well established or prioritised. And you could, for example, require trailblazer groups to identify progression routes from and to apprenticeships when developing um, standards. Okay, so that's something that would kind of raise awareness and, and, and promote uh, better, uh, better engagement with uh, apprenticeships for underrepresented groups. Okay, so resourcing and partnerships. Um, uh, it was fairly consistently identified in the literature and elsewhere that having, uh, for, for a pro provider to have a kind of central hub of expertise within a provider organisation, is one of the most effective ways to make sure that you've got consistent coordination of, of practice and the delivery of apprenticeships. I mean, in some organisations, this is, you know, they, they have one faculty that might be doing apprenticeships and other faculties that don't know anything about them. You know, so you get, that's a way to get kind of inconsistency of practice and, and it, it doesn't help with having a kind of strategic approach to the delivery of our apprenticeships that is kind of helped by having this kind of central expertise hub. So we think that's, that's, that's an important part of a sustainable model. And there's a difference between having highly expert staff from a kind of subject specific, you know, academic research point of view and ensuring that staff have appropriate industrial professional practice expertise and also that they have sufficient expertise in understanding and delivering work integrated learning. 
because there is something about enabling learners to recognize learning potential in the context of their work that what integrated learning practitioners will understand that some other practitioners in higher education won't understand and in some cases you have to deliberately support and develop that as an area of practice within a within a provider organization so that's another area that we think is makes it sustainable um, in, in terms of uh, partnerships, you know, apprenticeships are all about partnerships. You, know, you, you have to have a, a systematic and sustainable uh, mechanism for um, maintaining excellent partnership relationships, you know, and to and to not as a, you know, sort of um, a more important partner and a less important partner model, but as part, a partner of equals. So you, one of the benefits of apprenticeships is that, of course, higher education institutions are not the sole gatekeepers in terms of admitting people onto degree apprenticeships. Employers have to recruit them and employ them. So there's, a, there's an opportunity to have really informed discussions about what is appropriate in terms of uh, you know, designing and developing uh, apprenticeships to meet the needs of employers. And that kind of early engagement with, with employers is pretty important, but well, it's essential. Okay, so moving on. So program design and delivery. Um, the design of degree apprenticeship programs should not be as a kind of a, a bolt-on. So you've got an existing degree and you're going to have an endpoint assessment at the end, but you're not going to do much to the degree to change it. You know, that's a bad model of delivering and, and developing a degree apprenticeship. You know, actually developing it, as it says, from the ground up, thinking this is a degree apprenticeship. This is this is a, a form of higher education where, you know, the, as it's the workplace is, is going to be a primary source and, and resource for learning. So we need to design it on that basis to integrate on and off the job learning. And, you know, having a kind of digital first approach just, you know, immediately enhances the flexibility in terms of how things can be delivered. So not hardwiring in the fact that people have to go to a physical lecture hall to, to do things, that things can be delivered through digital means could be really, really helpful. And particularly in the light of COVID, you know, where uh, apprenticeships have had um, you know, mobile learning technology is built into them. It's meant that apprentices can continue on their apprenticeship learning journey, whereas other people are undertaking the, uh, the same apprenticeship with a, with a different provider who haven't built in a mobile learning solution have, have had to stop. So it's, it's kind of really fundamental to kind of build that in from, from, from the start. Um, yeah, so, and there should be a kind of recognition that um, the, the kinds of learners that are undertaking degree apprenticeships may be more diverse, may come from different kinds of backgrounds. And so building in, you know, the development and support for the development of, of higher education study skills and other kinds of skills to enable them to, you know, engage with this higher education experience through degree apprenticeships is something that should be uh, generally built in. And similarly, that the way they're assessed should be kind of authentic and should reflect their working practices. You know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't always be that they've got to write an essay on something. You know, it's not that essays are necessarily bad, but you know, what are people doing in the workplace? And can we use that as a vehicle for assessing people's competent competencies uh, rather than thinking about, you know, just more, more traditional approaches? Um, and that does, you know, have an impact in terms of how the workplace and organisation environment is, is set up. So you, you need um, to, you know, work very closely and strategically with employers to make sure that, you know, there's a clear alignment between what the organisation is seeking to get out of it and also, you know, meeting the requirements of, of, of gaining the qualification and indeed, you know, completing the, uh, the degree apprenticeship. So that needs to be a very clear understanding. And there are opportunities to, to kind of to, to, do, to do that. So what is happening in the workplace that might present an opportunity to somebody to learn something that will be a direct benefit in terms of achieving their uh, degree apprenticeship goals? How can we work together to do that? So, you know, work integrated projects, um, placements within an organisational settings, role rotations might provide different opportunities for learning that might enable people to enrich their kind of learning experience through their degree apprenticeship. 
<clears throat> and, and lastly on this one that, you know, there's a requirement that employer staff need to support the apprentices as well as tutors supporting them. This, the, in the last presentation, this kind of triadic partnership between employers, providers and apprentices in this case, you know, is, is really fundamental. And in order for employers to be able to do that effectively, they need to be supported, they need to be guided, they need to be appropriate structures around the kinds of support that they should, uh, and there needs to be agreement about the kinds of support that they're, they're able and willing to provide. Uh, Darrell, just one more minute left, if that's okay. Yeah, that's fine, yeah, on the last one. Thank so, you. Um, in terms of policy, um, you know, it's, imp it's important, um, uh, we concluded, that productivity and uh, social mobility were, you know, if you like, repositioned as the prime object objectives of, of degree apprenticeships. Uh, and also that, you know, the, you know, providing opportunities for underrepresented groups to access professional status. Um, and, you know, the, the, the great success of apprenticeships that is occurring and has been occurring for a while needs to be, you know, more wholeheartedly celebrated, um, we think, at, at policy level. Uh, and you know, the mandatory qualification rule, and, and there is work going on at, at the moment with, with, with regards to this recommendation in terms of a kind of a more flexible approach to that, that will facilitate the development of more degree apprenticeships. And that will be of the be benefit to, to, um, to a wider range of people. The quality assurance responsibilities certainly have been simplified, not in the way that we'd hoped, uh, but it's been simplified so that now Ofsted is now in charge of all apprenticeships at, at higher education level, level four, four to seven. So that certainly is a simplification, but uh, even though that wasn't what was uh, hoped for at the time of writing the report. And then lastly, uh, in terms of access, the kind of through routes for apprenticeships. So I mentioned this idea of um, hardwiring in progression to, in the development process of, of apprenticeships is one area, but also, you know, building in step on and step off points, uh, I think is, is going to kind of broaden the appeal and accessibility for, for wider groups. And lastly, uh, the, the, you know, the, the access that people have to degree apprenticeships is patchy nationally um, because of the way that they've been procured over a number of years. And so I think there needs to be a more consistent um, uh, availability of degree apprenticeship provision uh, across um, English regions. And that was, that was the last recommendation. So that's me, thank you. Okay, so um, I should stop sharing and move on to uh, Andrea, I think it was, was it? Yes. Uh, okay. Oh, right. Um, sorry, can I just ask uh, whether you see... Yes, yes you see, see the, the first slides. slide. Thanks, Andrea. Brilliant. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll... Okay, last but not least, uh, I'm going to talk to you about the evaluation of the Edge Hotel School and try to, uh, trying to summarize it. Uh, to be honest, I'm trying to do that within the next 10 minutes. Uh, let's hope I succeed. Uh, uh, the piece of work which was actually done by the Institute of Education, uh, uh, UCL, uh, and the team consisted of uh, Natasha Kersh and Natalie Hügler. Uh, with uh, expert advice from uh, Professor Karen Evans and Paul Greinger. So it's just to make sure it got through. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the research team to do uh, this piece of work. And I'm trying to make justice for their excellent piece in the next a few uh, minutes. So uh, the Edge Foundation has commissioned uh, a this evaluation of the Edge Hotel School, which is a practically based higher education uh, provision. And really the aim was to explore the Edge Hotel School model uh, and look at how they approach the link between the theory and the practice and how they <clears throat> uh, support still, uh, skills development for students. But at the same time, we, uh, we were also very keen to uh, have a, a view on whether the Edge Hotel School may have a wider implication 
uh, when we talk about the higher education as a sector. Excuse me. So um, the research team, excuse me if I sometimes say we, because I also do research, so I may just mix it up. The research team uh, has uh, taken a qualitative approach and they looked at the HTL school as a case study. Uh, they have done a number of uh, 27 uh, student uh, interviews, also uh, a small number with alumni. Uh, they have interviewed H Hotel School staff, senior academic staff from the University of Essex, um, and also two staff members uh, with management responsibility as Vivenhoe House Hotel. They also have done desktop research, document analysis, uh, and also uh, they, I think, uh, virtually attended uh, open day and an alumni network event because uh, they slipped into the uh, time of the pandemic towards the end. Andrew, I'm sorry to interrupt. For some reason, your slide is not moving on from the title slide. Um, oh, really? I can, I can share them from here if that would be easier. Um, hang on. Right. No, it's not going. I don't know why isn't that. Would you mind then, please? Of course. Uh, if you Oli. could stop sharing your screen, I'll, I'll do that whilst yeah. you're uh, Okay, presenting. and I'm on slide, uh, hang on, five, I think. Yep. Have I done that? Yes, that's fine. Everyone should be able to see now. Okay, in that case, I have to move myself out of the way. <laughs> uh, right. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? And the next one, and the next one. Yes, uh, one before, please. Okay, just to give you a little bit of a, a background uh, to the Edge Hotel School. Um, it was set up in 2021, 22, and it was a, actually a joint undertaking by the Edge Foundation and the University of Essex. Um, it, uh, the Edge Hotel School is really reflecting the Edge Foundation's vision for a more flexible and dynamic higher education landscape, promoting work readiness of graduates. And I think uh, this really came through very well from Katz and uh, Darius presentation as well. So the Edge Hotel School may be considered as an innovative ex example for practically based higher education provision in the hospitality field. And again, I flag up innovative example. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to uh, capture some of the ideas which we think uh, gives the innovative uh, justice. Um, there has been clearly a development uh, journey, if you like, of the uh, Edge Hotel School model. Uh, when it was uh, set up and started in 2011, 2012, the first iteration uh, was uh, delivered by an independent higher education provider, the Kaplan Open Learning. Uh, 2014, the Edge Hotel School became a limited, and that also brought uh, in uh, uh, curriculum reform and refinement. And also there has been a, a very purposeful and uh, uh, a strong building of industry net networks. Uh, then in uh, 2018 and 2019, the H Hotel School becomes a university department. So now is an integral part of the University of Essex. But in 2019 and 2020, the Edge Hotel School also started offering a three years degree, not only a two year degree, um, and a four-year degree, which is, an, uh, a, which is combined with a study abroad year. Can I have the next slide, please? So what are the distinctive uh, features of the Edge Hotel School? Uh, it offered initially a two-year accelerated uh, degree program uh, in hotel management and event management. And as I said before, now it also offers a three and a four year option. Uh, it, continue, it embeds a practice based learning through rotation in a, uh, in a hotel 
which is the Vivian Law House. So uh, the students actually train in a fully operational uh, hotel. And they also uh, experience external industry placements. Uh, the, their graduates uh, really uh, are industry ready uh, by the time they complete the program and they develop uh, strategic managerial and professional skills through direct experience of key operative roles at the hotel through rotations. But at the same time, they also uh, have a high quality academic experience. There is a very strong industry engagement uh, in the Edge Hotel School and the students experience uh, guest lectures. They uh, participate events and at the, uh, events and conferences. They also uh, can gain industry scholarships and uh, so on. Next one, please. So when we talk about uh, innovation, uh, what are we talking about really? And what is the evidence between uh, Edge Hotel School or any other higher education provision which we may consider uh, innovative behind? It is an integrated model of action-based research. It supports educational processes of boundary crossing, which allows students to apply skills reflect on practice and integrate academic and work-based learning on an ongoing basis. And uh, students use this and, uh, in different contexts. This embedded learning supports a sense of professionalism among students, which puts them in an advantageous position upon graduation. Uh, the Edge Hotel School creates a working culture and presents values of a distinctive hospitality organizations, which aims to create high quality customer experiences. As I mentioned before, they actually uh, train in a fully operational four style hotel. Due to the nature of the program, students develop a professional as well as an academic identity. There is also a high ethos of industry engagement, which runs through the whole of the program and is facilitated by a long-term commitment to industry relationships. Uh, the partnership between the Edge Foundation as an independent educational charity and the Edge Hotel School is in itself may be perceived as an innovation. Oli, can we skip two of the slides? And the, next, and the next one. Excellent. Thank you. Um, I thought it will be interesting to look at some of the challenges because uh, I, th I think uh, through my uh, overview, it gives you an, uh, a bit of an, uh, a feeling and an insight that the Edge Hotel School uh, does develop uh, employable graduates and it's uh, quite successful in uh, what they are doing. But what are the challenges uh, of the Edge Hotel School and how this could be uh, turned into development opportunities? I mean, it's clearly, it's complex. Uh, all the various factors of innovation uh, brings that uh, with itself and also the diverse stakeholders, the networks and the relationships, which all matter and uh, take up a lot of uh, time to build and sustain. I also mentioned that uh, students train in a fully commercial hotel, um, but that also means that uh, Actually, Edge Hotel School has two sets of customers, and one is their students, and the one uh, are the hotel customers, if you like. Uh, the hotel is working uh, with its students, uh, which are frequently changing, and the student groups are uh, constantly uh, changing. So that, again, uh, offers or provides another additional challenge how to deal with that. Uh, having said that, in order to maintain financial viability, 
the Edge Hotel school does have to attract a certain number of uh, students, which it successfully does. Um, and also, the uh, I mentioned before that the Edge Hotel School is now an integral uh, part of the University of Essex. It is uh, operates as a department, if you like, and that organizational context again offers both challenges and opportunities. Can I have the last slide, please? So just very briefly, what are the wider implications uh, for uh, this practically based higher education? And I hope that what I'm uh, flagging up here will resonate with what Kat and uh, Daryl was talking about before. Uh, it really showcases the success of action-based learning approaches, which is informed by industry engagement. Uh, it also highly integrated nature of the model supports professional alongside academic skills and identities. Um, for a vocationally oriented disciplines, this model supports appreciation of crossovers in the interdisciplinaries and intersections of different operational and managerial roles. As we talked about uh, students rotating in a hotel, while at the same time maintaining a clear higher education focus. Um, and the program's journey highlights the importance of careful balancing, managing and involvement of key stakeholders as part of process of innovation. Uh, we should not underestimate the complexities involved in setting up, refining and sustaining a new and dynamic concept and also the role of relationship of organizations and people within them. The Edge Hotel School model provides valuable insight into such partnerships and how uh, and, uh, such partnerships can be kept uh, synergetic and effective. And then probably as a final thought, uh, because I've been thinking a lot about uh, innovative higher education, alternative higher education or non-traditional higher education. How can we actually uh, define these uh, thinking of CATS National Software Academy and Darius Apprenticeship Project and the Edge Hotel School? Thank you. Well, thanks very much indeed, uh, Andrea, and to uh, Daryl and, and Kat for that really interesting set of contributions. There's actually been um, a very interesting and pertinent question in the Q&A, which I'll just briefly answer, and that's about um, cohort sizes at the NSA and the um, Edge Hotel School. I haven't got the up-to-date information, but certainly I can say that um, you can't do this in, on a mass basis. It does require relatively small cohorts, and uh, maybe somebody can put into the chat what the cohort, latest cohort sizes are, if they're known about. But in my head, we're talking numbers like 30 to 50. Um, so it's not like a lecture of marketing when you've got 500 people, that, that sort of thing. So let's move on to our uh, panellists. Um, I was going to ask each panel member to introduce themselves, but we are a bit short of time. We've only got about a quarter of an hour now, so I'll just briefly... Uh, introduce the panelists. And if I get nothing wrong, please do um, correct me. Uh, so we have Emma Bagnall, uh, a police constable who uh, did a BSc honours in professional policing practice at Middlesex University. So that's the degree apprenticeship route. And we have um, Lauren Johnson, who's a graduate of the Edge Hotel School and an employee now there at the Edge Hotel School, previously having worked for the Dorchester Collection. And they're on this sort of graduate side who've been through the system. And we have Lydia Trojanowska, who's the Tech Talent Programme Coordinator for Admiral Group PLC, uh, Admiral of the um, very well-known uh, insurance company based in Cardiff, uh, uh, who are an industry partner of the National Software Academy. So thank you all very much. If you want to um, reveal yourselves now via your <coughs> unmuting and switching on your video. Um, and I'm just going to start, actually, by asking each of you a question that, that came up uh, earlier from Sophie Chadwick, and um, that was about hitting the ground running. We heard that a few times, and of course, all of these programs are about learning by doing, and they're in, in many ways a, a response to employers saying, 
we want oven ready graduates or we want graduates who can hit the ground running. We don't have to spend a year, you know, training them up into our, into the roles that we want them for, which is a very common a sort of um, uh, issue. So it'd be very interesting to hear. I'll, I'll maybe start with Lydia as to your perspective on that and then, then hear from the two graduates as to what their experience was, was it in practice. Did you find you were hitting the ground running? And first of all, Lydia, uh, uh, tell us about this hitting the back ground running business. Thank you. Um, I think for us, um, the journey starts with the NSA because they've made the, the goal very clear. It's not just about teaching students, it's about making them employable. Um, and I think a second point is that um, the NSA are recruiting uh, or um, accepting students who are um, ambitious, they are inquisitive, um, they're, they're eager to learn. So those are all the qualities that we're looking for our talent pipelines anyway. Um, when it comes to hitting the ground running, um, the projects that Kat referred to um, in her presentation um, are real world problems that we're having as companies um, and they add value. So the NSA support the students in helping them to understand how to um, uh, gather requirements, how to ask the right questions and also learn from their mistakes. So if they haven't asked the right questions that impacts their projects further down the line. Um, and having the constant contact with um, companies allows them to see um, what the working environment is like. So it's not making them just making them work ready. They're actually making them business ready by um, joining in the same agile ceremony. So we obviously we're I work in an IT part of Admiral um, and it's all about software development and getting that development um, out and released in a timely manner. So that's done in an agile um, by an agile framework and, and the ceremonies we use are you know gathering requirements scrum planning um sprint planning sorry you know sprint development but then also retrospective so we look at um you know what went right in that two-week development cycle um what went right what didn't go right um lessons learned and how we can adapt so the students are always incorporated in that um in the student in the nsa but they're also included when we take them on as um uh, summer interns and what we're finding so I think it's the last four years we've had summer interns um, we've offered them jobs part-time jobs um, after the summer internships um, one individual um, was developing live code within six weeks um, of joining us and he was a second year um, so they, they've just got the right mindset and I think that's being nurtured by the NSA um, so I, I I'll talk to anybody that wants to listen about our partnership with the NSA because it, for us it's been a fantastic pipeline for talent um, and in South Wales everybody's desperate for great uh, for software engineers and we happen to be get, getting great software engineers from the NSA. Great thanks thanks very much so um, it is people come in and just get straight on with the job by the sound of it to uh, um, so should we come to Emma now? I think I introduced you wrong. Uh, there's something in the chat there saying you're a student officer apprentice. So you put us right on that. And, and, and do you feel you're being prepared for, you know, to go straight into policing? Um, it's really difficult to answer. I mean, because policing so, you, you have to learn so many skills to be a police officer. Um, and obviously if you've not done university before, obviously learning how to be a student as well is um, kind of equally is challenging. And then trying to balance both together um, has presented quite a few challenges. I was wondering about that. Maybe we'll come back to that afterwards, actually, where, you know, what's it like being a student, this kind of student, as opposed to the more traditional type. Uh, Lauren, would you like to give us your perspective on this? So you actually have graduated and are working. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I think you can jump into it knowing a rough idea because you've been given that great foundation behind it all. But obviously, each business is different, but you definitely learn the skills even whether it's just the confidence or networking to be able to talk to people in business. Like Lydia said, it's about gaining that sort of business head as well. So um, yeah, I think you can definitely jump straight into it. But like Emma said as well, you know, learning to be a student and trying to be that business professional can sometimes be quite, quite challenging. So do you feel you've um, missed out on anything by going, the, going this route rather than the more academic one? I wouldn't say so. I mean, Emma might have a different idea, but I think for me, I mean, I knew that I wanted to go into hospitality and the, with the Excel two year degree as well. For me, I was aware that I would lose out on holidays, for example, but to be able to get that practical experience in a four star hotel is just completely invaluable. So I think for me, 
I still had that student lifestyle, but the experience was so much more important. Thanks, Emma, how about you on that? Um, so for me, I did university before out of my own choice. Um, so I already had that background. I'd already kind of had that student experience. So I think I'm a bit of an exception to the rule here. Um, I mean, for me personally, I knew I wanted to join the police. I knew that was kind of my priority. Um, and the degree of friendship was just something that kind of came part and parcel with the job. Um, I think when you're signing up for something like this, you've really got to consider, do you want that student experience or do you really want to work hard and kind of achieve and start your career? Thanks. And if people want to look at the chat, there's an answer to the question about the cohort sizes. So the hotel school's grown a lot now, now into the high 70s. Um, and I think it was oh, oh, about a... Uh, well, it's going up anyway. You can look on your own. Um, so uh, what would you think was the, the most important things you've learned in terms of employability? And maybe we'd hear from Lydia about what the most, what are the things you, you most value in terms of employability? Emma? Um, inquisitiveness. Well, um, Lydia, go ahead. Sorry. Inquisitiveness, go um, being, um, being open and um, taking ownership of their work, um, even if it's just a small piece of work that they've been um, given. Um, definitely working in in partnership and um collaboratively working um it's we don't want to see um software engineers working in isolation it's all about learning and developing um each other so um it's it's all those small little things that you can't really put your finger on it it's it's like the complete package um and i'm not really sure what or how the nsa do it but they're a different kind of caliber of student that comes through our door when we have summer interns um we we've recruited from other universities too um but we we don't see the same caliber um they they're just ready and eager and um i think because they've worked on a number of different projects with a number of different employers by the time they get to us sometimes in their first summer um sometimes in their second or third um summer um they just seem to be um ready to get on and do some work it's almost like um they're wanting to be trusted and I think we are very fortunate, Admiral, that we do allow them to have that trust. Um, there is a support network around um, the intern, so it's not just they're embedded within teams. We're fortunate to have um, the tech talent team where we can support them. We're not on all the social aspect, but also just the pastoral care as well where they're with us. Um, but I just there's something that the NSA do and, and, and whatever they're doing, it's great. So I think the, um, there was a point made in the presentation and in some of the other research as well that it's the, it is the transferable skills, the sort of not just the subject knowledge and so on that people value. And that, that seems to very much accord with what you say. And I think what's happening here is that we're trying to recreate the workplace as, as best we can, actually give real work experience to, to people as they study all the time, not as go off for three weeks and get some. Would that be what you're finding, Emma? Um, so in terms of the transferable skills, yeah, I can definitely agree with that. I mean, it's it, both policing and the university, they do give each other their own transferable skills. So, I mean, personally, for me, I think kind of organisation, um, managing deadlines, critical analysis, time management has been the biggest one for me, just really kind of making sure you've got enough time to do your assignments as well as work kind of 24 hours around the clock. It sounds quite tough. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'd manage that way well. Um, Lauren, how about you? What What are the important things that you think you learned by by this learning by doing approach? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, I think the best thing for me was the networking. I mean, um, Edge Hotel School is so well known in the hospitality industry that the amount of people that want to work with them, you know, careers fairs, the amount of um, businesses that were there. I mean, my first careers fair I worked at, um, for Edge and then ended up meeting the Dorchester collection there. And then last year then came back to Edge representing the company and then I'm now working at Edge. So, you know, it's this full cycle where you gain the confidence that perhaps you wouldn't have had before. Um, and again, it's the same, you know, you can't ever learn about a guest complaint from a textbook. So having the time to learn it in real life, which is very daunting sometimes, but, you know, having that experience is completely invaluable. Okay, we've we've got we got just just five minutes now. I'd be interested to hear any, well, uh, from Emma and Lauren. You know, what what do you remember? You know, what's the thing that really stands out from 
well, you haven't quite, you haven't really finished with it yet, Emma, have you? But, you know, what well, has happened up to now? So, uh, you know, what, what really stands out? What's your favourite memory? Lauren, do you want to have a go at that? Oh, one? Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so, I mean, memories would definitely be, I mean, starting your first shift, obviously, when you go in is very daunting, but, you know, going through the ranks. So we have different levels as you progress through, so your different years. Um, and I think that when you then go in as the second year and sort of seeing how the first years are coming in quite nervous, but being able to impart your wisdom more for a yeah, better time on them. And then when you get to your final year, seeing where you, you know, where you've progressed and where you've come from and being able to go into industry with that, that confidence. I think each shift is different because people are, you know, everyone is different. They've got their own characteristics and things and obviously guests are different dealing, you know, complaints and, handling those various issues but there's so much good to come from it as well and I think being involved in you know a wedding or you know all those little experiences those are the memorable things I mean that's a great thing about hospitality is being involved in in different people really. Thanks uh, Emma. Emma? Um, I mean it's difficult to ask it's, it's similar to um, what Lauren said about how kind of every day every day is different um, always learning new things different people different challenges um, in terms of the university side, I think kind of getting those first assignment grades back and obviously you've got good grades um, and then you can reflect on how your performance at work um, may have linked in with those grades and just being able to balance everything and just having that sense of achievement when you've done something well. Thanks. And, and, and Lydia, just, just a final one perhaps um, for you. Uh, this, this, uh, the NSA is obviously a software engineering side. Do you think this could be, I mean, it could, it, presumably it can't be done for every type of degree, but in your line of, in, in your line of business, can you see this being done in other degree programmes? I think if um, universities are open to um, adopting a different mindset and looking at alternatives, I can't see why it wouldn't work. Um, that, yeah. I mean, if it, it's proven to work here, it's proven to work for software engineering, um, why not? Okay, good. Well, th thanks very much, everybody. We're just um, perhaps a, a, a couple of reflections um, that, that I've uh, taken away from today. Well, first of all, you can read all the research that um, was presented today. There are, there are links in the chat, and if you're uh, confused about any of it or, or, or have any questions, do get in touch with Edge. I know they'd love to um, hear from you about that. And to keep in touch with Edge, you can subscribe to their uh, newsletter on the EDGE website and also follow them on Twitter and their um, details are, are in the chat. Uh, there's going to be um, another report uh, published in a, a few weeks time so EDGE will be publishing a report showcasing some of the um, further and higher education case studies that showcase um, innovative examples of good practice from the UK and overseas. So they've done quite a lot of work uh, beyond uh, these, uh, these, these, these um, projects. But I'd just like to say from a personal point of view, um, because I've been a trustee of the EDGE Foundation for a number of years, and um, in fact, uh, originally was involved in the EDGE Hotel School and I'm still, of course, with the NSA in Cardiff, it's, it's hugely rewarding to see this. I mean, universities, are clearly there to create and disseminate knowledge for the benefit of all, but they are much more than that. Uh, they're much more vocational, I think, than people often think. You know, the engineering side, law, you know, a lot of the science sides. In fact, a lot of the, um, the other sides do. I think it's a model that we could adapt and take forward in, in many ways, just, just as Lydia said, if we're open to it. And it's fantastic to see a couple of people here who've, um, who've been through these types of programs and clearly benefiting from it and your sort of enthusiasm and commitment really shines through. So thank you both um, very much for that. And um, I, I remember staying in the, uh, in the Wivenhoe House Hotel before it was the Edge Hotel School. And, you know, I'm not, I, I won't say what it's like, but it was absolutely, it's absolutely fantastic now is what I would say. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a really transformed experience and it's great you know, with the, with the students actually do, doing the uh, sort of front of house and back of house and everything else. So that's it from us this evening. Thank you. A big thank you to all our presenters, to our panellists. Thanks for taking the time and thanks to everybody who attended. I hope you enjoyed it and see you next time. <laughs>